This is the second video in the hemodynamic monitoring series. In this video, we'll go over terminology associated with hemodynamic monitoring and start to look at how we can interpret those values and apply it to the various states of shock. First, we'll start with some cardiac vocabulary, preload. Preload is the muscle length prior to contractility, and it is dependent on the ventricles filling appropriately, and that's termed as the end diastolic volume. And this value relates to the right atrial pressure, and it consists of your venous return. So preload is your venous return. Afterload is the tension against which the ventricle must contract. If Arterial pressure increases, afterload also increases. Afterload for the left ventricle is determined by aortic pressure. Afterload for the right ventricle is determined by pulmonary artery pressure. Contractility is the intrinsic ability of cardiac muscle to develop force for a given muscle length. Cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped each minute and is expressed by the following equation. Cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. Stroke volume is the volume per beat that is ejected with each contraction. Our cardiac volumes consist of the stroke volume, which is the end diastolic volume, minus the end systolic volume, where the end diastolic volume is the amount of blood collected in a ventricle during diastole, and that's the filling phase. The end systolic volume is the amount of blood remaining in a ventricle after contraction. So that's the blood remaining, it's similar to ejection fraction, where you're supposed to have some blood that stays in the heart despite it just contracting. Stroke volume. It's determined by preload, afterload, and contractility. Preload gives the volume of the blood that the ventricles has available to pump. Contractility is the force that the muscle can create at any given length. And afterload is the arterial pressure against which the muscle will contract. And combined, this is what establishes the amount of blood that's pumped with each heartbeat. Okay, so there's three main types of shock. There's hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, and distributive shock. Distributive shock would include septic shock and neurogenic shock, such as that occurs with a spinal cord injury. And at the top of the slide in orange, I've got one, two, and three labeled volume, pump, and squeeze. That correlates with volume is your preload, pump is your contractility, and squeezes your afterload. And when we insert a pulmonary artery catheter, what we're doing is we're measuring pressure and we're assuming volume. So let's go over the normal pressures in the various areas of the heart. The right atrium is synonymous with the CVP, which is your preload. The normal values there are two to six millimeters of mercury. The pulmonary artery has a systolic normal of 15 to 30 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic normal between 8 and 15 millimeters of mercury. We can inflate the balloon of a pulmonary artery and obtain what is called a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And this pressure is normally between 6 to 12. And it, it's giving us an indirect measurement of the left side of the heart. So we're able to do a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and make assumptions on not only on the, we're able to make assumptions on the left side of the heart, the volume at the end diastole. So that lets us know what our patient's volume status is. So if it's less than the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, if it's, if we're looking at a number of three, we can assume that the patient is in a state of hypovolemic shock if we also have a low mean arterial pressure. Now remember that our mean arterial pressure, we just take a regular blood pressure and we take 
two times the diastolic blood pressure, we add that to the systolic blood pressure and divide that number by three. And the mean arterial pressure is the amount of, it's the average circulating pressure in the aorta. And you need a map above 60 to maintain vital organ perfusion. Afterload is also, we look at systemic, va we, we take systemic vascular resistance, which is normally between 800 and 1200 dynes per second per centimeter to the negative fifth. And that's a reflection of afterload, but we can achieve afterload. I mean, we can determine afterload by taking um, our main arterial pressure and subtract our right atrial pressure, multiply it by 80, and divide it by our cardiac output. And that gives us an idea of um, what's going on on the systemic side of the equation. So if you look at the chart, hemodynamics of shock, it'll let you know the what goes on in those particular states. So when someone's in hypovolemic shock, their preload's down. So you're going to see numbers of in the right atrium of less than two. Your cardiac output will be increased, and this is going to be a compensatory mechanism. And in the past couple of slides, uh, when we described cardiac output, the two components are heart rate and stroke volume. Well, think about it. The patient doesn't have any volume. So how is the body going to compensate? You know, compensate for this. It's going to raise the heart rate. So you're going to see low numbers on your preload, low numbers on your wedge pressure, and you're going to see an increased heart rate. And your systemic vascular resistance, your afterload will also increase. And the treatment is to just give IV fluids unless the patient's bleeding. And then of course you'll give blood. So that's exactly how you would go about treating hypovolemic shock. Cardiogenic shock relates to number two. It's a pump problem. And the indicators associated with cardiogenic shock is you're just going to have the opposite. You're going to have an increase in preload. Think about it. If your pump's not working, fluid's going to back up. And so the numbers are going to be high when you look at your preload and you look at your right atrial numbers. You're going to have 12, 13, and also it just, because your pump's not working, all your pulmonary artery numbers will also be elevated, and so will your wedge, and so that's what, that's how you can tell what happens in cardiogenic shock. You have high numbers, you know, when you look at your preload, and then you're going to have a low blood pressure. You're going to have a low blood pressure blood pressure because you have no stroke volume. Your stroke volume is very weak because that's what the pump does is it's the force that's going to help eject the blood out. And your body's going to compensate by trying to clamp down its vessels. So it's going to want to try to raise the blood pressure somewhat. It, it's not going to be able to do it, but you're going to have a lot of tight arteries. And so your systemic vascular resistance will actually go up. Distributive shock is oftentimes described as relative hypovolemia. Look at how the arrows are going. It's, everything's the same as hypovolemic shock except for afterload. And what happens in, hypo, in distributive shock is that you have, so if you have a septic patient, their arteries are slowly being poisoned to death by endotoxins that release chemicals that cause the vessels to dilate really big. And so the volume that would normally be adequate no longer fills the vessel. So the chemoreceptors inside the arteries senses the void in the vessel and they respond as if the patient is in hypovolemic shock, just like they would if, if they were bleeding out. And so what you see is you see an absolute decrease in pre, you see a decrease in preload, but it's not a volume problem. <clears throat> you have a, 
you have a problem with vasodilation. So you have to treat that with vasopressors. And it's very important that you do make sure, because those numbers are expected to be down, you do need to make sure that that your patient is hydrated, which can be hard to tell because if your preload is going, you're going to expect it to be down in septic shock, you really want to go ahead and give fluids as well just to be on the safe side because if you give a vasopressor to someone who might also be hypovolemic, you're going to create a metabolic acidosis, which can lead they're already heading in that direction and you're just going to exacerbate it. You're going to cause the vessels to clamp down even against zero volume. So that's one of the most important things is if you're looking at someone in septic or neurogenic shock, you, before you, before you, uh, a physician orders a vasopressor, they're going to make sure that they're, that they know for sure that they're hydrated. This is just looking again at hypovolemic shock. It's a volume problem. This is a preload problem. And the body's mechanism, before you may see the changes in preload and an increase in cardiac output or an increase in afterload, the kidneys are going to respond to the low volume. And that's due to the sympathetic response. And the sympathetic response is going to release baroreceptors and chemoreceptors, and it's going to activate the renin and angiotensin cascade that the end result being that the kidneys are going to slow down production of urine in order to conserve what volume that remains. So that's very important for you to understand that that's why we want to, you want to monitor trends of your urine output trends very, very closely, especially on a post-operative patient. That could be your very first sign that someone's about to be in trouble is that their urine output trends down. That's going to, that's going to show up a lot sooner unless it's just an, just a massive bleed. And uh, so you were not going to see these numbers change much, but you will see the urine output would be the first thing that you would notice. So that's just something that I think that is very important for you to know. Again, the treatment, if, Treat the cause, the underlying cause. If it's trauma, you'll give blood and you'll just give fluids if it's dehydration. And this is just a slide demonstrating the angiotensin renin system. Okay. When we're talking about cardiogenic shock, keep in mind that cardiac output has two components, the heart rate and the stroke volume. So when you're looking for the underlying cause, check for dysrhythmias because anytime the heart rate's too high or too low, you you could go into cardiogenic shock. And on the stroke volume side, think about heart failure problems. Think about does the patient, is the patient ischemic? Is, was, is there a recent MI? And that, that could be what is causing the pump problems. And with, the, with these patients, you're going to give inotropes and possibly send them to the cath lab for revascularization. This slide's just a reminder that the squeeze is the afterload, and that's the primary problem in sepsis. In early goal-directed therapy for sepsis, you want to keep your CVP between 8 and 12. So that's much higher than normal. So, and that's because of the reason we're going to also give vasopressors. And I was just explaining that that's something that you have to be very careful. So, so the protocol is that you will watch your CVP and make sure that the fluids are administered and that you are staying within a range of 8 to 12. And then on the sepsis steps, that's just going over um, systemic inflammatory response syndrome and the indicators, things that might may clue you in that your patient may be heading into a septic state. And if there's a confirmed infection, if you have two of those indicators, then it would classify the patient as being septic. And you would go into severe sepsis if you have any signs of end organ damage or, you know, hypotension less than 90. And, and 
indicator that you can look for is increased lactate levels greater than four. Lactate levels greater than four indicate that the patient is in a state of metabolic.